quickly about M.M. You know, we are a fintech company. We've been founded almost 10 years ago by two childhood friends called Tommaso Migliore and Federico Mazzurin. So both of their last names start with an M, so M.M. And we all agree within the firm it's a pretty bad name, but this is what it is for now. And nobody knows how to pronounce that. Sure. Um, but this is where it's coming from. So um, what we do is really rooted in... in um, in science, and this is really important for us. Since the, the way it started was that you know, looking at the financial markets and seeing how the data flood is increasing every day, um, you know, the, the thought initial thought was there has to be a better way to deal with that besides traditional econometrics. Um, and so the question was, okay, what technology can be used to make sense out of this immense? increased complexity of the market and the answer was artificial intelligence so this was not that the idea was oh let's do something ai it was really the other way around there was a problem in dealing with data in um coming up with good prediction for the financial markets and then the answer was we could do that with uh, artificial intelligence so the, the most people working for us are what you would expect um data scientists physicists etc this this rooted in science has also then a different angle that we excuse me right at the beginning started the the the, the m.m lab which was a collaboration with several universities across europe but they have a dedic in each of them a dedicated professor and his or her master and phd students supporting us um and the reason for having that is that one of the biggest risks you can run if you do something like we do is if there's some bias getting into the system somehow, right? So, and it can be various things, it can be very unintended bias or by, based on opinion. So by working with six universities, each of them having a different approach to research, it helps us um, leveling out this bias. So then over time, you know, um, clients basically came with many requests and interests how to use artificial intelligence within investment. And we developed a platform which is called Sphere, where then clients can basically approach that uh, and use that interactively. Um, it's a very, very cool feature. So that's kind of who we are. Um, so let's go a little bit back and think about and uh, how how it works. And so if, if everybody thinks it's this is too basic, let me know. I'm happy to to speed on on that. So artificial intelligence has you know the the big benefit that it um, it um, sorry, sorry. it works within rising complexity. This is what we have you know in in. The markets right now in terms of where data is coming from the sources of it what it actually means and what it can do is then it actually understands non-linear relationships and so this is where you know different information comes in that's completely unrelated but taking it together actually helps you solving an issue um and then another key thing of course it adapts when markets changes we have seen very often when we had a big financial crash um, often of what happened there and the, the problem for the for the clients, for the investors, was that you know within an asset management company, approaches were not changed, right? And the, all, the answer was always, oh, this has never happened before. And so, you know, this is what AI can do. It can prepare, it cannot foresee the future. It's not a crystal ball, but it allows to react extremely quickly to market changes and then react to that in a very unemotional, unbiased way. So the, the very key element to that is like what data is used. And so, you know, I always make that, um, after this experience, you know, you come and you talk about AI and people are, you know, very excited to hear about it since, since it's a topic that everybody talks about. And the expectation is we use the most esoteric data you can think about. Um, no. We clearly don't do that. And there are various reasons to that. The data you need, it has to be unbiased. It has to be there in abundance. It has to be unambiguous, right? So indisputable. Uh, and so you do not get that from um, photographs of the, uh, the parking, uh, parking lots of malls or from weather reports or from um, you know, news chatters, et cetera. So what we then looked at, we need something that has a long predictive horizon, a lot of predictive power. And if you divide the, the data world into that, you can see how 
you know, the, the, the news market sentiment, this is something that might help you if you are a day trader. Alternative data was well, very something really to be discussed if that can help. Um, but we found then something, you know, pretty boring. So it's historical market data. So it would be prices of securities. Anything you can calculate out of that. Macro data. So you need a framework. It's GDP, it's inflation, interest rates, and company fundamentals. So what's the price, the book value, et cetera, that we then combine together on a sector level to have you know, a relative comparison. So having that, that allows to have data, a lot of it, it's unbiased, it's unemotional, it's indisputable, right? So I mean, what do I mean is indisputable? If you look at what did General Motors stock cost yesterday at 10.30 in the morning at the New York Stock Exchange, here's one price, this is what it is, it's indisputable. So then moving on from having had that, so then how can, can it actually help generating more alpha, so more better performance than the market? <clears throat> and there are you know, a few ways to look at it. So on our side, we divide it in three parts, how it can help. And this is kind of interesting if you think about how the financial industry adopts AI. Very rarely, you, know, you come to a place, to a, to a wealth management company, to a private bank, says, Everything we do is rubbish. We throw it out of the door and replace it by AI. This is not going to happen for many, many reasons, and it shouldn't actually happen. So there, are, I think there are three, three areas, distinctive areas, where we see how companies use it. So one is providing insights. So that's about forecasts um, of performance, of risk. It's about, you know, should you overweight U.S. stocks or European stocks? Should you overweight investment credit, credit emerging markets, etc.? And this is... This is used for, for chief investment officers within investment committees, strategists who need to have a bigger view of the market, who don't say, I want to pick specific stocks. They think, okay, what? where do I need to have my money? Do I need to have it in gold? Do I need to have it in real estate and other things? And so in this case, you know, you provide help, support in giving this data about, you know, why should I overweight U.S. equity and how much? So this is providing data-driven insights. The second bit is then, um, how do you put a portfolio together, right? And so, so there, there are, you know, in investors, investors, they are feel very comfortable in the way where they get their insights from. But I say, well, the way I put it together, I really never thought a lot about that. So they might, what's a good way to doing that? And again, so, you know, we, we build um, a tool that allows to put portfolios together in a very efficient way to um, lead to the results that are expected. And so this is then something you would use within fund management, could also be with ETFs, discretionary mandates, wealth management, advisory uses that a lot. Uh, and so it's kind of, you have either the investment side of a company, so chief investment officers, portfolio managers, multi-asset teams, or actually the client-facing group, so the advisors, the bankers, who talk to their clients and it could help them modeling their portfolio. So these two things are driven by analytical AI. The last one, which is like what we call it story folio, um, this is generative AI. And so if you have the first and the second one, um, one thing that happens all the time is that clients will say, okay, so why does it actually work? Why do I have 5% Japanese equities in my portfolio? Um, and so th this questions, you know, this led us to, you know, developing a generative AI that helped explaining all of that. And it's really funny. I mean, if you um, if you talk to, well, you are a client of a portfolio manager who is a fundamental manager who is picking stocks the last 25 years, um, you know, then you ask them, so why do you have that position in the portfolio? And then he or she would say, well, you know, I've visited a company, you know, for, for 20 years. I know the CEO very well. They are good. So if you do that with AI, nobody's listening to you. So you need to dig much, much, much deeper. And so this is why we developed a channel to AI to ex help explaining these positions. And within Storyfolio, this is then where this all comes together and allows mass customization at scale. That's what I, what I said um, at the beginning that, you know, looking at some of the EU directives that require um, more uh, bespoke services, this is, a, this is a result of that. You know, if, 
if you have as a as a as a wealth manager tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands different portfolios, and all of them require reporting, it's very hard to do that, especially if it has to be quality. You know, if it's not just saying these are my top 10 holdings, but it's explaining why these positions are. And so this is what we have developed here. Each of these things, clients, some clients, they only use Storyfolio, they do everything else by themselves, all use balance software. So that's an interesting way of basically seeing how within the financial industry, AI is adopted and it's usually adopted in places within a company where um, it's an easy entry point. Right? Um, and this is with the, the, the commentary, the story for you part. This is often the case. Since you talk to an asset manager, to a wealth manager, they usually say, I'm very proud of our research. We have, you know, 5,000 company meetings a year. You know, we have a, a great optimization tool. We've been developing it for 25 years. You never hear anybody saying, you know, our portfolio management is kind of average, but our reporting is top notch. Right? So then actually getting into a discussion with these kind of clients through the reporting. So Storyfolio opens a lot of doors. Um, so let's look a little, little bit more into how this is look, how this would look like, how it's used. So in a very basic way, um, you know, there are these two parts within portfolio manager. You have ideas and you gather them and you construct a portfolio. So what we call intuition alpha, this is basically being good with forecasts. Right. This is kind of if you think about the three pillars we adjusted, it's like having great insights. And then the operation alpha, which is maybe a little bit of a misnomer, but this is the, the way the alpha you generate the performance you generate in putting the portfolio together in the right way. That's the construction. Um, and so it's, it's making the right calls or then systematically achieving that, that outperformance. So that is the traditional way. So using AI, you can actually, on both parts, you can add alpha. And this is, um, I don't want to go down too much in, in numbers, but, you know, as, as I mentioned, client also said, this all sounds fantastic, but is it actually working? And so what, what we have done then um, over time to help with that is that we basically look at the quality of these forecasts that have been generated and can show that it's actually working. So, just as an example, it says geographic equity. This is basically looking at the the, um, the AI's opinion about what you should overweight and underweight. Should you overweight U.S. equity or European equity, emerging market, etc. What is key in this area in terms of acceptance is that it's actually based on real numbers and not a backtest. And so, in, in our case, you know, so we've been around for. About 10 years um, have been actively looking after clients' money for at least eight of those. So basically, the, the numbers you see from our side for the last seven, eight years are real numbers. And that helps in for clients to see, okay, this is it's real. So yeah, we have that part we think we can really add alpha here. Or this is actually, I really like this, it's quite cool. Um, this is comparing a traditional way of managing money, which is called the mean variance optimization. The two gentlemen, Black and Litterman, um, who came up with that way, and it's the absolute standard within asset management. Um, and so what we have done, we we generated thousands of different scenarios, basically how markets could behave. Um, and then we applied, we had these scenarios and applied a traditional mean variance optimization, used our own methodology to that, um, using the same forecast for everything. And so that the only difference was actually the way of um, of putting portfolios together. And you can see that using artificial intelligence can actually be quite beneficial. And so this, this again, if you think, how is this actually used in the, in the financial industry? That really then depends on the kind of company, right? So if you talk to a company who is very, very proud of their portfolio optimization program. They don't want to, to look at that, but they might something else that applies. For others, this is, this is an entry point. As an example, which is often surprising, like um, a fundamental portfolio manager. So this is somebody who basically goes and visits companies, you know, uh, goes and visits the competitors, the suppliers, the clients of these companies, of course, looks at financial data, and through all of that forms an opinion you know, about what to buy and what to sell, you would expect 
a person like this would not use a technology like artificial intelligence. But what they often do is they, they, they are very excited about these great companies they find and just put them in a portfolio that say equally weight. Each company has the same weight since they think they all are great. It doesn't matter. And then they look at this and can say, huh, here's something I haven't done before. There might be an interesting way to get a little bit more performance out of my great selections. Right, so this is then where AI comes in as a tool um, that helps, in that case, a, a fundamental manager to uh, come up with a more robust result. Yeah. So you know, this is you know, the, the point here to make is just that you know there's a way in in delivering alpha to helping um, financial institutions to come up with a more robust, um, solid process that helps them to have you know, decent performance in unexpected market circumstances. And this is, I think, where AI is the greatest help. Created, sorry, is the, is the greatest help. If basically hell breaks loose, everybody gets very emotional and, and nervous, and AI is very calm and considered and comes up with a, a solution that should be looked at. So this is, if you think about the three pillars, these were the first two, analytical AI that's helping with forecasts and putting portfolios together. And so now, <clears throat> so using the generative AI that helps in explaining what happens in plain language. And this is actually quite interesting since if you just think the effect of, of good portfolio commentary. So, of course, they can help describing portfolios, explaining performance that really helps engaging with stakeholders and it builds trust. And this is often what's missing. Um it, it helps on the sales side, you know, since if you can show good commentaries, insightful commentaries, they're upda updated on a regular basis. So in, in what we do, for instance, it's every day. So as soon as something happens, there's a change in the market outlook, there's a change in the portfolio, you know, the, the reporting would be adjusted. Market standards, you know, five years ago was you got your, as a client, you got your quarterly reporting at least 10 days after the end of the quarter. Now you have, you know, with this kind of technology, you can have ongoing reporting. Um, it also can hear like insightful commentaries that are very explanatory, that give interesting views. They give a lot of value to the investment activities as well. But of course, doing this is super time consuming and very, very human capital intensive. Yeah? Um, so generally, I can solve the, solve the problem, but there are a few things everybody should be aware of. And, you know, who, whoever has played around with chat GPT, uh, at the beginning, this was very um, obvious, uh, still to some extent it is. So large language models hallucinate. We know that, right? If, if you give them free reign, basically access to all of information, and you ask a question and the model is, doesn't know the answer, it comes up with stuff, which usually sounds really logical, but sometimes it's very, very wrong. So you have to make sure that you exclude that, that you exclude the possibility of hallucination. Um, LLMs don't understand numbers. You, you, you asked ChatGPT, you know, uh, eight months ago, what's, you know, 1,524 times 11,212, it didn't come up with an answer. Now it can do some of the basic stuff, but it's it, it does not understand numbers, which is clear. It's called large language model, not large numerical model. You know, what large language models do at the end of the day, the goal is to find the next most possible world. Yeah, so you have to be very, we have to be very careful when using that. Um, you want to have commentators tailored to each portfolio. So that's a real, that's a timely challenge. And of course, they must align with the specific of each individual portfolio to be effective. And so you, you need to basically have a what we call a controlled generative AI that does a coherence check. So start with this. So let's say you, your market view says um, we are very positive about European equity. We should overweigh European equity. It might be one of the thousands of portfolios of a client um, has some restrictions in it that don't allow an overweight of European equity. So the AI needs to see that, understand it, and make sure the commentary does not talk a lot about this overweight in equity. Avoiding hallucinations. So this is really containing the information 
the the generative AI has access to to make sure it's not coming up with stuff that that's wrong. So this is very important to have that environment also to um, have that learning and the teaching environment for the AI within that that part that it does not allow hallucination. Um, relevance check is the other thing. If you want to have, you know, let's say you, you have an, an investment, you off the world, very detailed about the equity side, the fixed income side, commodities. You, you, you talk a lot about, you know, buy gold is currently a fantastic investment. What's the background of that, et cetera. So if this comes down to a portfolio, that's not allowed to hold commodities. You know, there should not be any comment about gold in it. So it, it checks that as well. Um, and then it kind of, to achieve that quickly, basically it splits things down in prompt. So in, in small or less complex tasks, it then allows to have a very qualitative good input and also understand if there are points, if there's no coherence at all, if there's a portfolio is completely different to market view, that it just would be very quantitative. So just to make sure it's consistent. Um, and then to the last bit, of course, you know, personalization through the style, language should be used, etc. Um, so that's a, that's an, an interesting. Then what it, what it does is really again, this is coming to my last point about also a bit of the role of humans. So you know the humans would provide the view, their view, or can provide their view of the market. They would say this is how the portfolio looks like. This is all the constraints and preferences for the model portfolio. So it's real. It's like working together. Um, you know, we look at it as like machine delivers and the human surprises. It's about creativity. It's about, you know, being quirky, being, uh, being kind of interesting. So again, if we start with this little picture, um, and then you can see how this can help. So, you know, Investors have an idea about in what direction markets could go. They can get support through AI that they get, okay, what is the expected return generated by AI? How does this differ from a technical analysis, from a fundamental analysis, from an expert panel? Um, then using that, you know, leading to portfolio construction to a better, more robust portfolio construction uh, that then can be, you know, led into customized portfolios dynamic risk targets, et cetera. And then through that, you have improved and more stable performance and it basically goes all around. So in that process, the artificial intelligence does really the heavy lifting. So it analyzes all this data. It looks at these you know, nonlinear connections to find that which in theory humans could do, but of course, you know, based on the mass of, of data and the possibilities of connections, it, uh, it would fail doing that. Um, but it's always the human who remains at the center of every decision. I think this is the important thing that AI is a fantastic tool. It needs to be used properly, but it's really fantastic. So will AI replace us? No, but somebody who is using it definitely will. Um, this is what one of our clients said, which I think is it's, it's a great quote. Adopting AI in our investment process has given us an augmented humanity to make better informed investment decisions. So it's, you, know, you, you have something available. Why wouldn't you use that? So let me just close with a few brief use cases. Um, let's, let's start with this. So this is a, a it's an asset manager based in the US. Uh, it's about three hundred billion in assets. They they started in using it for asset location, portfolio management, and scenario analysis. And this is kind of really interesting if if you look at um, you know this bit here, right? So they had an investment committee that was developing the tactical asset location. They had an approach doing this for quite a while. We were reasonably happy with it, but thought, okay, okay. <clears throat> I have to have a different view. I have to have another insight that helps me. And so this is then when they started using basically forecasts about overweights, underweights, about expected returns driven by the AI. Um, and that was not a replacement. It was just an additional insight um, that helped them coming up with their strategic asset allocation that helped with their funds. Um, and then it, after they actually saw that these insights were quite helpful as a second step, then they said, okay, let's try to see if that can help us in portfolio construction as well. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so that was a, this is was quite interesting. Um, it was a large insurance company. Um, th this is like the the dream case for every AI provider. Uh, here was an insurance company, um, as you know, mainly life driven. That means there are a lot of regulations about what they're allowed to do. The majority of the assets have to be in very safe fixed income securities, which well, the, the general account assets that has to be matched with the liabilities. And there's a little bit like a surplus account, but this is where they try to generate excess return. This is where they are allowed to use equities and, and, and other asset classes. Um, so what they initially wanted is a better control on the allocation within the general account in, in uh, connection to the uh, to the surplus account. Um, they thought about doing this and um, they also wanted to get more of the, the equity investments in-house. They had outsourced that to third-party managers. They want to get in-house to have more control over them being more flexible um, in case liabilities change, they have to do something about it. They initially um, budgeted about a two th two year process for that and about three million euros to implement it. The whole thing has taken about four months, and I have to say we didn't get three million dollars for it. But it's an interesting way that, for them to see. And so they also started with you know having um, expected returns. They look at market regime so that's a, a certain way of looking at risk that helped for their strategic asset allocation then they used you know at the end some tactical indicators that helped them tweaking the portfolio and as a as almost as a side they um took most of their equity portfolios back in-house and basically use sphere to manage equity portfolios it's like a couple of hundred million they do there. So a, you see that there are pieces and bits um, where th this was, you know, basically a change of the investment policy, putting stuff in house. This was getting better um, asset allocation through additional insights. So it's like putting things together. It's not replacing everything. It's just finding a areas where that helps. So last one. And this was then more from a wealth management company where it's the issue, okay, we have a few model portfolios. <laughs> but we, at the end of the day, we need to create, you know, thousands of individual portfolios. And this is where they very, could very easily do that through having, you know, the investment committee views and AI view. They put that together. It all gets into a sphere. They have their model portfolios with requirements. And then the AI can provide literally hundreds or thousands of different portfolios for them, including customized reporting. So you can see the different ways of using it for an insurance company. Reporting is not relevant. For a wealth manager, it's super important. So there are different ways of looking at that. So come to the end of, of that presentation. So I hope that found some interest and I'm very happy to discuss in any direction you would like to go. <coughs> I read recently a summary of a BCG, Boston Consulting Group report that said um, something you touched on. In, in investment banking used to recruit, used, used to sort of do the milk round and used to sort of hoover bright graduates out of universities and pour them into the, the bottom of a funnel where they spent their first two, two and a half years, basically just churning data and, and reports. And yeah. already that's being flipped upside down in the sense that actually we, we don't need 20 or 30, we might need four or five. Yeah. And they need to be more AI literate and they need to be good at actually prompt generation and analyzing the analysis rather than generating generating the reports and that that's going to be a sort of fundamental change yeah to yeah. To, to the industry um d do you see that con continuing and, and where's the where's the end point for that yeah i mean it's a, the, the, but the kind of really part of what you say is also the fact that um, you know when, 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 when we started m.m 10 years ago artificial intelligence was something for the the tech connoisseur 
right? Something you you enjoyed after hours kind of thing. Um, and of course, often the people who used AI, they, they built the models as well. And so, but what we have seen really in the last three years or so that what you say, the difference, people don't have to be completely AI experts, they have to be AI literate. And so we, we definitely see, see that as well. And it's what I think where, where it goes to is that companies have to understand how they should adopt AI. And it's it's a very, you know, it's a very important process how to do that. Um, I still see a lot of companies saying, oh, we use AI. We hire two people from university, they're doing AI now. This is not going to happen. And, you know, there are companies where AI can help at the fringes and for others at the center. And so I thought, this is where, where this is going to, that AI is becoming a stable in company, but the companies have to decide where does it actually help. And this is then also where the talent will go, right? Where the talent mm -hmm. is appreciated. Yeah. <clears throat> on the, on the topic a, of talent. Yeah. So, so can yeah. I just add, add one, one aspect to that? So what mm -hmm. I, I also found an interesting observation. So this is for many having AI within their investment process, it's to some extent a radical change. It has to be driven from the top. If the top management is not approving that, it's not going to happen. Often, and this is I, I, I can say that I'm old enough to say this. So often, you know, they, the people like with gray hair and and you know that have been in the business for 30 years have to make these decisions. And for them, it's hardest to understand the technology. So that's an interesting juxtaposition. But sorry, you are talking about talent. Yeah. <clears throat> the uh the salaries for, for AI talent in Silicon, Silicon Valley and elsewhere are, of course, astronomical. Um but there's rumors that uh, Silicon Valley is lo losing some of its top talent to finance um, in the in the back alleys. Uh, finance people are are coming in and, and throwing people into unmarked vans and taking them to make uh, more money in different places. Um, so I guess one question is, is, is there are the rumors true? But then uh, another kind of question is uh, that AI's you know, in the last 10 years or, or 15 years, AI has beaten chess and it's beaten uh, Go and it's beaten poker. And uh, and we've seen the you know the, the documentary that that shows the the incredible moment when when the, the Go champion goes down uh, and in tears and the poker players go down in astonishment. Yeah. Um, has AI beaten the stock market? Or when are we going to see the the documentary that that shows <laughs> the, the so, stock room floor that, with the tears? Yeah. yeah, I love the question. I love the question since it highlights a lot of things. So. Let, let's start with your initial comment about talent going from Silicon Valley into finance. Um, first of all, the, the demand for AI talent within finance is much younger than the demand of AI within technology. Right. So that's, I think this is really, I mean, for, for my observation, what was a crucial <coughs> point for many companies to really think seriously about AI was kind of ChatGPT coming out. So that is much newer that people need to take it seriously. Um, the, the appeal, I mean, if you think about everybody was going, every AI expert was going to Silicon Valley. What a tough competition, right? The smartest of the smartest compete with each other. So if you then move into finance, you are the smartest. So that couldn't be appealing that suddenly more people are listening to you have more impact. It's just, just an, a thought, right? Um, but that to, to your comment on, on, on that side, Harold. Then the other one about, uh, you know, beating the master of Go or, um, you know, Deep Blue a couple of years ago and in chess. Um, and when does it beat the, the, um, the stock market? I mean, as we know that, you know, the, the board game of Go is exponentially more complex than chess in terms of what you can do. Um, but it's still, it's a limited frame of rules. Yeah, there are a limited number of stones you can use. Um, it is there. There's a lip, there's a clear defined option what you can do, right? After every, you know, your opponents put out a stone. There's a limited option of what you can do. It's and you can calculate that. In the stock market or the financial markets, it's much wider about what can happen. You know, I would say there are no rules. What about what can happen? 
Yeah. Is there a natural disaster? Is there like a political issue? Is there whatever, you know, as the central bank doing something uh, surprising, unexpected? So this is so much more complex. I think to have a way of consistently beating the market, it will be a while. Since there are just too many variables involved that predict that. So when you say there's, there's alpha in the AI, um, you can't, there's no numbers on that yet. It's just, is it a, how do you, no, how are you? It, it, it is. I mean, this is what kind of what I showed. There were numbers on it. This was alpha generated through using the AI. Right. So you, you can see that if you, if you look at the two optimization possibilities, right. Um, let me show that again. Is that, is that not in, in some sense beating the market or is it not beating the market? I'm not no, it, it is, it is, um, oops. It is beating the market. It's it's also beating others. Okay. Um, beating the humans, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that was a smarter way of doing this. Shoop. You know, if you here, so this is basically this is the traditional way of doing it. And that's the AI way of doing it. Right, so, so that's hmm. right. so. What's so happened to the, the the great silver-haired investment gurus that everybody used to follow, that would take you to that bottom graph with all of their well legions of of anal analysts and report writers and okay. and their and their forecasts. Yeah, that you know is have have we are we seeing the the, the demise of those um those in investment gurus or uh, is there does it come back to their role is changing and they're taking what ai has said well because of my vast experience and now the increased analytics that i've got yeah. i can now forecast even better it so also that i would say the ai in, in finance is not to fix all thing about our performance Right. So um, you know, think about what I said about data. It needs to be, you need to have a lot of data that has to be reliable, it has to be accurate, unbiased, you know, undisputed, et cetera. So there are financial markets, you don't have that. You know, private equity, private debt. You know, you only get a price for private equity actually when you execute. And so you get a real price every couple of years. So using AI in that context, for prediction for risk is not possible. Um, things like, if you like Asian small caps, again, there's not the right data. So there are ways, there are areas within the investment universe where the AI, the way we use it to predict or to help putting portfolios together and you know, make prediction about risk and return, you just don't have the, the, the basic ingredients to it. If you look at more efficient markets, this is where AI is strong. This is where you have a lot of this data. This is where you have to find these connections, right? And so this, and this is also where I think what AI is, is doing is, at least the way we use it, it's trying to come up with a portfolio that's most suitable for any change in the market, right? So if you... If you would just look back and say, okay, the, the last couple of crises we had, COVID, um, you know, the, the uh, CDO crash, tech crash, and you also go back and with, and you think, oh, I have a situation now that's very similar to the tech bubble bursting. Let's do what I should have done 20 years back. This is not going to help you now since it's going to be a different crisis. And so the, the way the AI works is space is trying to understand the properties of the market and not to repeat it. Right. And so this is a very long winded answer, but basically there are areas in the market where the AI will provide superior results. And there are other areas in the market where AI just can't help yet. And, and Harold, presumably there are some very clear legal parallels in that using firms that start to use AI for analysis of precedent and previous results and previous contract drafting, 
will come up with uh, potentially some, and I think you've said this yourself, you know, some new sort of some nuances, some new ways of doing things by aggregating all that information and spitting it out and saying, look, here it is. And there are some areas where actually it's it's not going to be helpful and you need that human interface. And even jurisdiction by jurisdiction, uh, we find uh, Americans are much more um, happy with uh, vast amounts of data and vast amounts of uh, predictive precedents and stuff, whereas uh, here in Japan, it's very ad hoc. Uh, and low data, so we might be we might be safe from the machine takeover for a little bit longer in Asia. Um, we yeah, have a lot of actually. You know, yeah. <laughs> did Did you want to speak to the the beauty of Asia and its investment? Yes, yeah, so, so I I've lived in Asia for many years, um, in Singapore and in Hong Kong, and traveled for my job to Japan almost every month. Um, and outside the whole the society is very tech affine. Right. They like their gadgets. They like to use technology. They like apps and all of this. And it's kind of interesting to hear what you say that within the professional world, it's it's not the case at all. Whereas the you know the society as a whole uses a lot of tech, a lot of concrete tech, a lot of uh, like say gadgets, but very little uh, abstraction in in software and um, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a very yeah very different perpendicular kind of division that we would normally have. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Uh, a technical question. We, we came in with a lot of kind of legal questions about um, how you manage regulatory challenges, which you may or may not have insight into, but um, just in the technical side. So you, you've been doing this since uh, around 2020. So I, I assume that you sort of started with a symbolic AI approaches, which is where the investment insights and the portfolio rebalancing uh, gets its uh, AI name and it's AI juice. And then did, and then you added, did you add the uh the, the portfolio story folio aspect yeah. around the generative AI boom in 2022, 2023? Uh, yeah. So I said we started about 10 years ago. So the analytical part is about 10 years. Also it started 10 years, also continued uh, developed and improved. Um and this was all analytical AI. And then but what what we found when we also started the sphere with that platform that people demanded more explanation. Yeah, so why I have to say I don't want to have a black box. I need to understand why we overweight US equity. And so what we then started doing, we started developing generative AI to help explaining that. And this was actually before the big chat GPT bubble came out, so that we started looking into that. That kind of then accelerated it. Um, and then it's also when we basically started using that for story folio for the commentaries. But it was really then to, to have a, a way, have an uh, efficient way to turn the, the analytical information we have in, in context and put that in words. And the control aspect of that, is that RLHF or how, how is that, how is it controlled on the, on the back end? Um, so you mean that the text that comes out is actually correct? Yeah, when you're saying that, like, uh, if if you don't want uh, heavyweight in European stocks, it pushes it in one direction, or yeah. Um, so th there's a part of the company we have is called Mission Control, um, and they part of this is what they do is like quality control. So is it does it make sense? They they will not change it, right? So. Um, they will not change the output. If they think there's inconsistency, we have to go back to the drawing board. So there must have been a problem in the architecture of the AI. But they will, consi will consistently observe to make sure it, it's it's logical what comes out, it's what the system is supposed to do, what the AI is supposed to do. And that would be the quality control. So on the legal side, um... The uh, big question is just regulatory challenges. What what kind of regulatory challenges are you facing? Um, so, you know, of course, we you know we, we we see how regulation develops. The, the EU is coming out with the AI Act, um, that also applies to financial industry. Where uh, you know at least we, financial services would fall in the part where you do your self assessment about about it but uh, so we followed very closely so far you know we always were on a level where it's not considered to be regulated since it's 
it's an input that's used. Uh, it doesn't make decisions that are automatically implemented. Um, but you know, it's it's evolving in such a fast pace that the legal environment as well. So for us, it's always to make sure we we stay on top of that. But you know, we it's not managing a portfolio. It's it's providing insights. It's a tool that's used. Um, so so far, you know, we are in a situation due to the way we offer the solutions that we don't have to be regulated. We we are for the, in the UK we are regulated, but this is you know by choice, not that we have to. Harold, and maybe Dallas and Samuel as well. Um, I'm a client. I've been a client of lawyers in the past. And one of the challenges I've experienced as a client when a legal team has come in, external counsel has come in and presented me with contract revisions is an immediate deep dive into the legal technical aspects into sub clause, blah, 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 you know, okay, great. And, and, the, and the, the need for this and why it's been rewritten and so forth. And much less of the executive summary that actually I as a client would find really helpful. And I see as good lawyering, somebody who comes in understands the business imperative for the risk mitigation that's gone on or for, or for the structuring of something but that's not in that's not the way that the legal teams have engaged with me now maybe i've i've clearly been using the wrong lawyers all of these years um do you see a story folio equivalent for law firms in future you, the use of ai to uh sort of extrapolate changes to a contract and communicate that to a client? Or does that just come down to actually, you need to use better lawyers, Keith? I'll let, I'll let you jump in, Dallas, because you were, you <laughs> well, were, you were, you were yeah, I mean, from my my perspective, I work with tons of, you know, emerging companies and, and clients that are contracting services to, you know, the biggest companies of the world, uh, you know, we're dealing with Visa and it's basically like, this is what Visa said. These are the changes I made because they're important. Here's the ones where they, we didn't change and you're going to get screwed by them. Um, but we know they'll never accept the change here. And we do give like the business kind of thing, just simply maybe because of the types of clients that we represent where, you know, they know that they're not, they don't have a bunch of negotiating power. So it is, primarily hey this is what we change this is why we change it this is why this is important um you know from um i'm actually just got an email from a client that uh one of their um customers wants to have them uh, our client indemnify the customer against all data breaches and we're like well what if it's your user that got compromised and let this in like we can't you know so it's the executive summary of that is you know so and and again i've used now you, I think we've talked about this in this group, but I've used um, probably I have paid versions of Claude and uh, GPT, uh, OpenAI, and I use that for the summaries and for the plain stuff. No, no contracts yet. Um, I've been arguing with all the service providers about the fact that they train their AI with everything I put in, and as a California lawyer, that's an ethical violation. I can't do that, um, and they argue with me about it, and they were like, "But it's secure. We have." You know, AES one twenty bit eight or one twenty eight encryption. Now, I'm like, well, that's irrelevant if you're using my data. But, <laughs> um, I but I so I'm already using it to help with those summaries and those executive things. But it's not. I'm just not running the contracts through because I don't trust any of the services that have been presented to me not to train. But you all, I think it's very client specific as well. Right. Sorry. Um. Because if, you're, if your client is very knowledgeable about the situation, the story folio is very light. And if they, if they need a long explanation, it'd be different. Whereas I guess in the investment field, um, your clients are basically all on the same page when they're looking at for an explanation of the changes or the insights. Yeah, yeah and but it's, it's also, it's very adaptive. So yeah, I appreciate that, you know, that uh, investment commentaries have not... Um, the same, you know, significance as what what, what Dada said about a legal contract, um, but 
you know, it's about your clients can can say the structure what they want. They say, I want a, I want a detailed summary, five bullet points, three bullet points. This is a tone I would like to have. Um, and so the, the, I think the adaptability is that what's appealing. But, I, you know, when we talk to to large wealth managers, they have a similar, you know, say, okay, how do I make sure that every single contract, every single document um, that's produced is correct and doesn't say something that's that's stupid? Um, you know, there's, if you have humans working on 100,000 different portfolios, I'm pretty sure there are a few of them are wrong. Uh, probably more than if an AI would do it. So that there's a there's a margin of error. Um, I think with investment commentaries, um, that's on a level that's bearable. So there's there's an interesting one for the for the lawyers then, because is there ever is there ever a a, a a sort of a level that's bearable? I suppose it de it depend it may depend on what the contract is, what the client is, what you're negotiating. There's a an ongoing debate in our firm. <laughs> I've been waiting um, for the the AI system that listens to two sides. And maybe this would be good for what Dallas was talking about, but like listens to the both sides and makes the changes to the contract in real time or, or drafts the uh, drafts the agreement in real time with the contributions of both sides. Uh, and then both sides can just check it and say, oh yeah, that's actually uh, pretty much what we were what we were looking to do. That, that's what I um, said, yeah. That, I, I mean, the hard part with that is there's never going to be agreement on like what's a neutral term to do accomplish X as I've found many, many times being a smaller firm put, being put up put up against you know 12 attorneys on a call from one of the big firms over a single issue and not even having them agree on how to approach it that's i think maybe one of the technology technological challenges is okay what does neutral look like so. yeah if it's what if it's 12 on one <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that was it was the client our client was just laughing they're like i hope they enjoyed their bill for no stuff that could have been an email <laughs> So what do you Excellent. think is coming in the next five, five years, uh, heading out 2029 for the finance industry? Um, I think a few things. I think by, by that time, using AI is completely accepted and nobody really talks about it anymore, that it's AI. It's just an additional service that's used. Um, also, I think by then, you will clearly have seen the, the companies who did their homework who confronted himself with a topic and found the, the places where AI can be helpful or can be most helpful for them. Um, I think that would, that's something we're going to see in the next two years, at least where companies who just think they need to say, I'm doing AI, are not really confronting themselves with that. They will fall behind. Um, but I think it will come, I wouldn't say a commodity, but it, it will be something that's, comp that's very accepted where people understand the boundaries of it and understand the opportunities of it. You think you're going to get more capable? Sorry, more, 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 um, better and better alpha. Um, more capable. Yeah, I think it's always this is like if, if you do it properly, you know, you it's not that that uh, the AI is learning, but you also try to fine tune the way it, since the, the human is coming up with the architecture of AI. So, what do you use? How do you use it? What what machine learning technique do you use? I think that's getting better. Um. If you go, but you could even think if you go whatever, like 30 years out or how long, you know, everything basically you, you the AI will, will be so similar everywhere that there's no alpha left since it's arbitraging itself out at some stage, right? Um, but I think for the next five years, we'll move from being kind of something mysterious to talk about to be something that's completely accepted and more understood. I was compared that in. You know, if you think about the, the ESG discussion in the finance industry, we're going to have an ethical, social, and governance issue considered as part of the um, investment um, process. You know, I remember when, I think 25 years ago, um, when I was working in Europe, the, the Nordic states were very, very early on with ESG. And then everybody said, oh, yeah, we, we got to use ESG. Yeah, that's important. Everybody has to use that. But nobody, nobody knew how. So, what is you know, what is an ethical company? What is good governance? 
Uh, and so it took a while and this came to a point that it was clear what it meant, I think, in the AI is in a similar process.